Hello, my name is Tiffany Owen and I am the Instructional Coordinator for Lincoln and Fort Stanton Historic Sites here in Lincoln County, New Mexico. We often hear that history repeats itself and since the year 2020 is going to be forever defined by the coronavirus, I thought that this lesson would be particularly poignant. Additionally, April is Occupational Therapy Month, but we'll talk more about that in just a few minutes. Like most forts built on the frontier, Fort Stanton's original mission was to protect settlers, subdue the Native American tribes, and convince Americans back east that it was safe to go out west. What nobody could have predicted, however, was that Fort Stanton would end up living many lives. This is another one of her stories. You probably can imagine that life on the frontier was often very dangerous, and because a fort like Fort Stanton was like a little city of its own and always had a doctor on hand to deal with injuries and diseases, it was only natural that people in the rural communities where doctors and health care were rarely available would come to see the fort as a beacon of hope in their darkest hours. Many military forts on the frontier were being demilitarized and abandoned in the last decades of the 1800s and since most had been built of adobe, it didn't take long for Mother Nature to reclaim that moment in history. Unlike those other forts, however, Stanton had been built of sturdy rock. Sadly, after only 41 years of use, silence had replaced the sounds of bugle calls, cannons, rifle drills, and marching boots. And yet, there was still this strong complex of buildings, considered one of the most architecturally beautiful forts in the West, wasting away, empty, abandoned, and unused. Meanwhile, back east, and in many parts of the world, a terrible disease was killing thousands of people each year. It was known as the White Plague, and we now know that this disease had been killing people for millennia, even as far back as the ancient Egyptians. The White Plague was another name for tuberculosis, or TB for short, because patients who had TB were so sick that their skin would often become extremely pale. Another name for TB was consumption, and this was because the disease also caused its victims to lose a lot of weight, and it almost appeared that the patient was being consumed by the disease. For centuries, people did not know what caused the disease and superstition led many to believe that vampires were actually behind the epidemic. The symptoms of red swollen eyes, pale skin, and skin that was cold to the touch added to the mythology. TB is a disease that attacks the lungs and would usually first appear as a cough. After a while, the patient would begin to cough up blood, have terrible chest pain, and trouble breathing. They would lose a lot of weight, have fever, night sweats, chills, and be extremely tired. Tuberculosis sounds like a very bad thing, doesn't it? Well, it definitely was, but it might surprise you to know that although it was accidental, this terrible disease is partly responsible for bringing even more people to the West. These people were known as health seekers, and by the 1920s, they made up almost 10% of New Mexico's population. Now, for most of human history, people lived in the country and were pretty far apart from even their nearest neighbors. But as people started to form cities and lived and worked closer together, it was much easier for diseases like TB to spread. It seemed that nobody was immune to the disease and it took a huge toll on teenagers and young adults, so TB had another ominous nickname, the Robber of Youth. But the White Plague also had a big impact on our military because soldiers were packed into barracks and sailors lived below deck on ships in extremely cramped quarters. Many members of America's military forces and merchant marines returned home from abroad with the disease. By the late 1800s, TB was a worldwide epidemic. In the United States, 70 to 90 percent of people living in cities had the disease. In places like London and New York, 
Many poor families often lived in a single room, parents, grandparents, and children all together because that was all that they could afford. Would you believe that during the time Fort Stanton was being used as a military fort, the disease had become so common that it killed about 4 million people in England and Wales alone? Can you imagine a time when most of the people in the country didn't have access to a doctor or especially a hospital? Today, if someone in our family coughs, we usually just think they have allergies or they swallowed wrong or maybe they have a common cold. But in those days, the fear of tuberculosis was so terrifying that a cough from a family member would have created extreme fear and distress, especially at a time when the death of a husband and father could mean that the family became destitute, and the loss of both parents often meant that children ended up homeless or in an orphanage. At first, the medical profession thought that the White Plague might be something that was hereditary or passed down in a family, or possibly it was something that you could catch through touch. Fortunately, by the early 1900s, doctors had discovered that TB was transmitted through the air, so for many centuries it was possible that a person could die just from being coughed or sneezed upon. So many people were suffering from TB, especially where the big cities were located back east, that the government devised a plan to set up places called sanatoriums where people could be sent if they had a long-term illness like tuberculosis. As people had started moving to the West, it was discovered that TB patients seemed to get better faster in places with a sunny, dry climate. One theory was that it was actually the sunshine that was responsible for the improvement, which led to some interesting treatments. In 1898, a doctor named Dr. J.O. Cobb had been searching the Southwest for a place to establish the nation's first tuberculosis hospital, and he decided that Fort Stanton was the perfect place because it had a water supply, a peaceful environment, and a year-round mild climate. President McKinley took the recommendation, and on April 1, 1899, he transferred Fort Stanton to the Marine Hospital Service, making it the first federal facility established solely for the study and treatment of tuberculosis. And with that, Fort Stanton was reborn as a place of healing. Over the years, Fort Stanton's doctors and nurses were instrumental in discovering and developing many of the treatments that help patients get better faster. In the early days, two of the fort's barracks were converted to dormitories where patients were lined up for treatment but it was already known that this was in complete opposition to what patients needed to get well. Most importantly, open space and fresh air. Doctors who were selected to come work at Fort Stanton were typically TB patients themselves. One of these doctors was Dr. Paul Carrington, who worked with architect J. Ross Thomas to create an open air tent with canvas sides that allowed patients to get almost constant ventilation. Each tent came with two cots and a stove, and by 1907, rows of tent cottages lined the terrace at Fort Stanton, housing between 185 and 240 patients. By the 1930s, the tents had been improved several times until they were finally replaced by full wood structures with real windows. Can you believe that today some people actually choose to live in tiny houses like this? Another doctor who came to Fort Stanton as a TB patient was Dr. James Laws. After a few years at Fort Stanton, he moved down the valley to Lincoln and opened a tuberculosis sanitarium at the Old Ellis Store, a location that had been significant during the Lincoln County War. After long hours of caring for patients, Dr. Laws would personally build TB huts for his patients to live in while they recuperated. One of Dr. Law's original TB huts still exists today as an outdoor exhibit at Lincoln Historic Site. In 1936, the building that was referred to as the New Hospital opened at Fort Stanton. This hospital replaced the hospital that had served the fort during the military era. Fort Stanton's was the first federal tuberculosis sanatorium established in New Mexico. 
In its time, this hospital was considered very advanced, especially because it had one of the first elevators in the state of New Mexico. Most of the doctors selected to come to Fort Stanton were chosen because they were tubercular patients themselves, so they were highly motivated to understand the disease and conduct research to find treatments and a cure. Many of the doctors and nurses who worked here contributed tremendously to research toward the cure and treatment of tuberculosis. It may be hard for us to picture now, but in these early days of New Mexico, towns were very small and there wasn't much here. Can you imagine living in your town but having no hospital, no clinics, no pharmacy, and maybe, if you were lucky, there was at least one doctor who had to take care of everyone in the whole county? The Fort Stanton Hospital was initially intended for sailors known as Merchant Marines, but it became a place of healing for everyone from miles around. For people in the surrounding small communities, Fort Stanton became the place that they would go when they were very sick, had broken bones, to deliver a baby, or even to have a tooth pulled. Patients with tuberculosis were also sent here from all over the country because Fort Stanton had such a high success rate for saving their patients. After they recovered, many of these patients married and had families and decided to stay in New Mexico. So it is a strange accident of history that a disease actually helped settle the western United States. After World War II, tuberculosis was less of a problem for most Americans but because Native Americans had been forced to live closer together on the reservations, it was now a major problem for them, and they sought treatment at Fort Stanton. Ironically, the fort that had originally been established to subdue the Native Americans was now saving their lives. But Fort Stanton wasn't finished yet. There was yet another era in her life. For 35 years, Fort Stanton operated as a school for the mentally disabled. It was called the Fort Stanton Hospital and Training School, and its purpose was to help people with disabilities. For many centuries, people who had disabilities or mental illness were put in facilities where they weren't treated very well. Sometimes they would even be kept in chains or locked in rooms and left alone for years. But in the early 1900s, people began to believe that this was not the right way to treat people with disabilities and efforts were made to take care of them in more productive ways, maybe even teach them a skill that they could use to make money and support themselves. About the same time, nurses who were taking care of soldiers returning from World War I noticed that the soldiers would get better faster and be in a better mood if they had something to do. Out of this problem, of trying to make hospital stays more tolerable and help people with physical and mental disabilities learn skills to survive on their own, a whole new profession was born called occupational therapy. And back in those days, many soldiers came back from battle severely wounded. So they not only had physical pain, but they had the fear and anxiety and sometimes depression caused by the possibility that they might not be able to do the job that they did before they became soldiers. Many people are familiar with physical therapy, which helps get your body working again after you've been sick or injured. But occupational therapy is different because it is holistic. That means that the therapy is intended to deal with your whole self, your physical issues, but also the issues in your mind that might affect your recovery. Many of you probably know someone who is in the military or maybe someone who deployed overseas or was injured in a war. Some soldiers come home with physical injuries or traumatic brain injuries that make it difficult to do the things that they've known how to do for most of their life. Here at Fort Stanton, occupational therapy has been used through many eras of the fort's existence, the military years, the tuberculosis years, and the hospital and training school years. You probably never thought of it before, but making crafts and doing things that are creative is not just fun and enjoyable, but it develops all kinds of biomechanical skills that you don't even realize. You think that you're just doing something fun. Did you know that every time you move, your body and brain are coordinating to make that movement happen? 
Your brain sends the signal that travels at warp speed to your muscles and tells them how to move, in what direction to move, and even how much to move. The word motor isn't just a car part. The original meaning of the word motor is to produce emotion or action. And there are two types of motor skills for different muscles in the body. Gross motor skills are big movements that your large muscles make, which is like when you're running, swimming, doing jumping jacks, or climbing a ladder. Fine motor skills use the small muscles in your hands, fingers, feet, and toes for activities such as riding, buttoning a shirt, tying shoes, or typing on a computer. The patients receiving occupational therapy at Fort Stanton used gross motor skills when they exercised on the parade ground every day. They used fine motor skills when they worked on crafts in the OT building, like these soldiers who were using their smaller muscle groups to hold drawing pencils and paintbrushes. You've probably never thought about how much your brain has to work just to keep your body moving throughout the day. Now imagine you are a soldier returning from battle and you've unfortunately had to have your arm amputated. How hard would it be to get dressed? To find out, sit on one of your hands and try to button your shirt or tie your shoes. Hopefully this will never happen to you, but if it does, an occupational therapist could help you find new ways to make it through the day. Occupational therapy first emerged as a profession over a hundred years ago, just after World War I, when soldiers started coming home injured or disabled. Many of them had long hospital stays while they recovered and nurses noticed that when they gave the men a craft to work on, it not only helped them regain their strength and coordination, dexterity and motor skills, but they seemed to regain a sense of purpose and their mood improved. OT was also important because TB patients were forbidden to work or do anything strenuous. Their condition often left them very weak, so making crafts like baskets or toys helped fill the long hours in between medical treatments. Over time, scientific research found even more benefits to making arts and crafts. In addition to using your muscles in your brain, you are also engaging and enhancing your five senses. Can you guess how many of the five senses these young potters are using? Yes, these students are using four of their five senses when making a bowl on the pottery wheel. But wait, one of our senses is missing. Can you remember the one which is definitely not used in pottery? Taste, that's right. The sense of taste is known as gustatory perception. Let's hope that these kids aren't planning to taste their clay. Yuck. As if your brain doesn't have enough to do just sending signals to your muscles to move, it also engages in all kinds of cognitive skills while you're creating something. Occupational therapists who work in schools, nursing homes, or in mental health facilities like the Fort Stanton Training School often spend a lot of time using crafts to develop skills such as decision making, planning, following direction, attention to task, problem solving, concentration, coordination, self-control, sequencing, delay tolerance, time awareness, and much more. Research has revealed that perhaps the most significant benefit to crafting is the emotional lift that human beings get from the act of creating something. While using your hands and all of your other senses creatively, you are making your own choices for colors and materials, expressing emotions through your art, revealing your mood, feeling accomplishment when you learn something new, setting goals, sometimes socializing with friends while you work together, making memories of home and nostalgia, feeling generosity when you make something for someone else, and hopefully you get a boost of self-esteem when you show your work to someone and they love it. Throughout history, occupational therapists have been healing bodies and healing minds. And Fort Stanton played a part in that legacy. Fort Stanton and Lincoln Historic Sites continue to promote this tradition of healing through occupational therapy at our special events and school tours. Children attending Fort Stanton Live and the Rio Benito Folk Fest develop their motor, cognitive, and perceptual skills by learning about the folk art of quilting. 
Some use the quilt boards and manipulatives to recreate a traditional quilt pattern, while others chose to design their very own original quilt square. Special events at both Lincoln and Fort Stanton historic sites frequently include, include crafting activities for kids because of the many hidden OT benefits. What may seem like a mindless or even childish activity is actually developing the body and minds of the children. As they fold the paper and manipulate the pieces of their craft, they are enhancing fine motor skills, bilateral coordination, hand strengthening, grasp skills, dexterity, and muscle tone. Many of these skills reinforce improved handwriting. Meanwhile, while they think they're just doing something fun, their minds are expanding cognitive abilities, attention to task, concentration, problem solving, coordination, self-control, time awareness, delay tolerance, following direction, and sequencing. Local students attending our spring school tours get to walk through the somewhat spooky hallways of the 1936 tuberculosis hospital where they end up in the sunlit therapy room on the second floor. There the students make their own pinwheels. The sensory system is in on the act too. As students choose colors, fold paper, smell the markers, and hear the sound of their pinwheel when it spins, their visual, tactile, auditory and olfactory systems have all been engaged and are firing off information to the brain. And as the students complete the pinwheel with the uplifting sense of accomplishment as it begins to spin, they reflect back on the devastating disease that once brought people from all over the country to Fort Stanton. So how could a child's toy benefit a person sick with a lung disease? Well, he could work with a respiratory therapist who might instruct him to inhale and exhale 10 times. The patient's mind would be completely focused on the act of breathing in and breathing out. Likewise, a patient who blows on a pinwheel is also exercising his lungs by breathing in and breathing out, but instead of being focused on the exercise or the pain associated with it, he's probably distracted by the act of making the pinwheel turn and watching how the colors and designs blend when it spins. The mental health benefit comes from the act of creating something. The patient has control over the colors he chooses and the design that he creates. For a patient stuck in a hospital room or in one of those small TB huts, these pinwheels might bring some color and fun into the environment. Even on days when he didn't have the strength to blow the pinwheel, he might place it in a flower box and let the wind lift his spirits. That's what occupational therapy does. It helps fix what's physically broken as well as fixing the mind and the soul. And so Fort Stanton's buildings still stand after 165 years of almost continuous use, a testimonial to many stories in the history and settlement of the West. A place of determination, a place of beauty, a place of historic significance, and a place of healing that literally played a role in helping to save the world.